filmmaker Jean-Marc Vallée is here with me in Studio Q. Hello. Hello. Uh, so this script has been on your radar for a while, since before uh, your 2014 project, Wild. What yeah. stuck with you about it? The script, it's always about the script. And when I read Brian's site script, I was... Uh, 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 it was it was it was a uh, one of a rare quality. Uh, uh, so uh, so uh, and it's rare. It's rare to find this kind of material. Hmm. And uh, I was curious. I was I was it was a page turner. It was surprising. I was laughing out loud. I didn't know at all where we were going. Normally, you have an idea of you know what the story will be about. Mm-hmm. This. No, not at all. This constant guy, surprises. Constant surprises. Yeah. It was irreverent, provocative by moment, and yet deeply moving. And uh, mm. so at the end, and at the end, I found myself surprised to have a, a, a beautiful, deep emotional moment. And not because it was sad, because it was beautiful. Mm. I found myself having a tear, almost crying, and go, oh my God, this is so nice. Just, you know, reading and... Imagining this guy running on the boardwalk, an imaginary race against kids, random kids that are running and, mm. and, and winning the race. Of course you're going to win. You're an adult, <laughs> have longer legs. And, but it, it was beautiful. Yeah. And uh, beautiful the journey, the curious journey he went through yeah. to find the light, to find himself back to... To life and yeah. and this this film be be in in uh, behind the uh, in the guise of a of a of a study on grief is a film that celebrates life and love and that's why it attracted. And them. it was m- that moving just on the page. You're like, if when I bring this to life, it's going to be that much more. Yeah, I, well, yeah. Well, I hope to. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I I was struck by um, all the different ways that our lives collide, and we sort of demolish each other. That's what I was left with after I watched the film. I thought, this happens accidentally in the film. It happens violently in the film. It also happens meticulously. There's yeah. meticulous demolition. Why does Davis Mitchell want to take everything apart? It's, it's a metaphor, you know, and he's using this, uh, what you just said uh, when you open uh, the interview, you know, uh, sometimes, you know, uh, human heart, you know, in, a, in order to understand the human heart, you have to uh, just, it's like an automobile. That's his uh, fa- uh, father-in-law that says that. And uh, you got to take everything apart and put it back together. And this idea triggers and, and triggers this curious journey and, and gives him the idea, gives him this uh, thing where he's going to really try to do this in order to try to feel something because he's wondering, he's witnessing. I mean, you lose someone close to you like your wife and you don't feel anything. What's wrong with you, man? And he's witnessing around him. Everyone is devastated. So he knows there's something wrong. And and uh, so... So he's deconstructing so, his world, but really he wants to deconstruct his heart. He wants to see what's going on. Can I feel something? And then he starts to, with this, with this deconstruction, but mainly with the demolition, he thinks that he's trying to feel something. And, and, uh, and it brings him to this, 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 and the script is made in, in, in a fashion where, whoops, there's this new character, this female character played by Naomi Watts. Mm-hmm. And whoops, 20 minutes later, she has a son. And whoops, it develops a relationship with this son. That's why I was saying, you don't know where the story is going. Mm. And yet, you want to follow this guy and you care. Well, I care, and I hope the audience will. Mm-hmm. And, and to see him trying to get back to what he was one day before he got numb by the train, le, le, le train, train de la vie, you know, mm-hmm. the, the daily things that we're doing when we go to work, we make money, and he's making a lot of money. He has a mortgage, a wife, and he had no kids yet, but and a car, and this, and and he's not. He's just like, all right, this is what I became. So this accident and this thing makes him makes him want to, you know, okay, I'm not, I'm not, I know I'm not feeling good. I don't know what's going on. And now, and he feels, and he looks like a kid, a lost, a lost soul, that becomes a kid 
and she meets with him. He meets with the, with Naomi Watts' character, and they're both like kids trying to figure out, uh, you know, what their lives are about and provoking each other and yeah. and in an honest, you know, way, trying to be honest. And he is trying to be honest. And uh, it's hmm. funny how we talk about it. And it's it, it looks and it seems complicated. I hope I'm not scaring the <laughs> audience. and Because uh, it's a film that, from, you know, you, you, you sit there, don't try to find out where this is going, and you're going to have a journey that is, that is a special one. And, As you uh, said, there's so many things in this film. There's, there's humor in addition, and we, we'll get into the humor. But in terms of the demolition, could you, for the people who haven't seen the film, could you give us some examples of some of the things Davis Mitchell smashes? Yeah, he starts with, with deconstructing his fridge, and then, because the fridge was leaking, that's how the accident happened. Uh, that, that was the last conversation with his wife. And, uh, and then not only he deconstructs the fridge, but then he takes the, all the different part, all the different elements apart, and, and he's breaking them. And then, and then he remembers to take everything apart, put it back together. Hmm. Hmm. And then he does the same with his computer. And then he, by accidentally, he was going to see Naomi Watts' character, uh, Karen, and, and that's where he saw it. He saw a site where people were doing uh, some demolition of a house before rebuilding, and uh, he asked them, can I join? That looks fun. So he starts to work with these guys. The are demolition the, crew. The demolition it. crew think, are you the insurance guy? No, no, I was just driving by, and, you know, and, oh, and uh, can I join? You know, I'll pay you. Well, who are you, man? You're the insurance guy. You busting my balls? Barry sent you to bust my balls. And see, they're so funny, and yeah. and, uh, and then he's paying them, and then and then and after uh, working with them, uh, he hurts himself, and then he has the idea of we're taking apart my marriage, and he starts breaking his house with this kid, demolishing and trying to feel something again, and. Uh, and he does at one point when he goes into his bedroom, when he sees her dresser. And, and you can see that he's lying a little bit because he's having some emotional moments here and there when he talks about her, about his ex-wife uh, on the train to this guy. I didn't love her. And then he gets emotional and he's holding back. He's holding back emotions in his bathroom at one point. And then when he demolishes the dresser of his wife, his wife's dresser... Uh, He's so, with so anger, and uh, I get emotional when I see him do that, and because uh, mm. it's so beautiful. It's a female dresser with jewelries and some fragile things, and he's just smashing the shit out of it. Mm. And you go, man, what the fuck? Come on. And break down, do something, cry. Why don't you? And that'll, and, and by breaking the dresser, whoops, he finds this sonogram mm. and finds out that she was pregnant and oh, wow, I think I'm revealing too much. <laughs> Jesus, what am I doing? Well, you were getting emotional uh, talking about Jake Gyllenhaal's performance as, as Davis Mitchell. Why was he the right person to cast for this role? Uh, you know, it's always about finding the right actor who respond passionately to the material and, and when we sent the script to Jake, I mean, the guy just wanted to, to do this and and he, it was the first amazing response that we had from an actor. And I loved, you know, the kind of actor he, he is and what he's done in the past. And he's not afraid to take risks. And, uh, and there's an intelligence, you know, before the acting, when you put the camera on this guy's face, there's a sadness about him. There's an intelligence. There's a... I'm, there's a, I'm, an I, emotional I, quality already. There's, there's an emotional quality, and he hasn't started yet. And uh, and of course, he's handsome. And there's something you care about this guy. You care about the face. There's like a goodness. There's something good. Hmm. And he is when you work with him. He's so nice. He's so generous. He's so giving. And uh, so, and then you say action, and then you see what he does. And so, the first take is always stick to the material and he does what the script is asking to and then the second take without telling me and telling anyone bang he goes somewhere else mm. cut 
Really? All right. Interesting. Let's do another one. And then, uh, bang, he goes somewhere else again. So, really? Oh, you like to do that? So in the first week, I was like, okay, he, threw, he got me out of my comfort zone. And sometimes I was asking him to go back to the first take, to what the script is asking. But then I really, really, and then I was asking him sometimes, let's, let's go somewhere else. And let's, you know, and... And that's a that's a lovely description when you talk about someone's inherent goodness coming yeah. across as soon as you put the camera on them. And there's no acting. There's, and, yeah. and see, and I think we will you'll feel this about this about Davis Mitchell. And it was important to care about him because you know having a rich millionaire white dude with a, this kind of problem. <laughs> Can I change the channel, please? <laughs> what what you know? What's wrong? Hey, you want to slap him, man? Wake up, man! And uh, so we need to... Uh, it takes a special quality to uh, empathize. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you know what happened with this film? I didn't know. I, when, I, when I shot it, I didn't, I didn't have this idea because normally when, when I shoot and when I cut, I don't want to interfere with the editing. I want to keep the shots as long as possible and trust the storytelling and the acting because I'm on the set. I'm witnessing what the actors are doing and I'm, I get emotional. So... If you try to, I'm not cutting performances. I'm capturing them, and then I try to stick to this. That's why the kind of editing that I've been doing is long shots, not with demolition. There mm. was there was a problem with that. In the first 20 minutes, when I start started to cut the film, and I I was doing what I was doing, I went, oh my God, this is so boring. I don't like this guy. I was judging him. I had to, to think too much because nothing was going on and this guy didn't know what to do and he was always stoic with the same expression. So I started to cut the film like an action film. Bang, 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 bang. Always stimulating the brain to give another information so the audience won't have the time to think and judge this guy. And, and wow. bang. And, and so if you look at Demolition, it's cut. There's so many cuts. I've never done that. There's like 600, 700 cuts. You've always been a director that allows yourself to feel the emotion while you're running the scene. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Look at Dallas. Look at Wild. Mm. Look at Cafe. The shots are long. And yeah. I'm speaking with director Jean-Marc Vallée about his latest film, Demolition. It just premiered at the Toronto International Film Festival. You've had to deal with grief in your life. Yeah. You lost your mother. Yeah. Did you feel the urge to deconstruct the world? No, no. I, I, I felt the urge of directing Wild. And mm -hmm. I was supposed to go from Dallas Buyers Club to Demolition. And then I received the script, Wild, and I, I lost my mother earlier. And I went, okay, okay, I'm going to go and pay tribute to this kind of woman, to my mother, because Cheryl's mother was very similar to mine. And uh, it was a, total, uh, you know, a totally different reaction than Davis. Mm -hmm. But uh, you you but, wanted to pay tribute by working on it on a project that uh, yeah felt that meaningful that that yeah yeah I wanted to the the projects I knew when I read the script of Wild that that it was a film that was paying tribute to to women and to this to mothers to and and the film is a love letter to a mother I mean Cheryl I've ne I've never read anyone say the love of my life my mother was the love of my life and. Uh, and uh, yeah, so so that's how I, I yeah the, the, my 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 grief because I was holding back when it happened and then and I didn't mourn you know I didn't cry and then I read Wild and this is why I mean I I this is why I cry like a baby like a year and a half after and I went Phew. and it's interesting see, how that happens eh yeah and see Davis Mitchell is not allowing himself to cry like a baby and I wasn't too. But I didn't go through, you know, I, 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 yeah, I, I didn't feel that this, this urge of deconstructing, but I felt lost and there's, there, was a, there was an emptiness. There was something, someone was missing. And still today, I mean, it was, she was a powerful energy and so positive and optimistic, just like Cheryl's mom. And it was annoying when I was a kid. Mom, please. God wakes in mysterious ways, son. I know, stop it. And... You go, you can do it, and yeah, but you know, and and then you miss it, and 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 and, uh, and that's why I'm saying, you know, this film, 
it's it is a study on grief yeah. and uh and it's 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 violent to lose someone close like a parent or a wife and even worse a child so i have two sons i wouldn't you know i don't want to think about this and uh but uh it's also a, a meditation on and, and the reason why i asked is it's a meditation on uh, dealing with the expectations of others around your grief. Yeah, exactly. What the system, what the society is asking or is, you know, used to. You're grieving, but you're also dealing with people's expectations. Yeah, yeah. And when you don't have this, the, the same feelings and the same reactions, you're looked in a weird way. And, and Davis is allowing himself to have a different reaction. And he's trying to explain to Phil, Phil, you know, there's something, there's something wrong. And I, I know there's something wrong with me, but, and, and yeah. yeah. That's a kind of collision I see in that movie too, between the reality of people's lives and the social expectations. And at some point there's a collision, there's a demolition. Yeah. Absolutely. Is that something you were trying to say with the film? I'm sure Brian, yeah, I'm sure, yeah. I'm sure it was, uh, Brian and Brian's uh, conscious or unconscious uh, intentions, and because uh, that's how I felt too when I read the script, and I and I was embracing that that point of view, that reflection, and uh, and uh, but you know say yeah yeah of course we want to say things and uh, writers directors, but mainly the first goal is to tell rather than to say things, is to tell a story. That's how I attack a project. And the project is, I'm a director and I'm going to tell this story because of its humanity, because of what it, what it, what it makes me feel. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I'm ready to put, you know, give two years, three years of my life to maybe at the service of this story. And, uh, and of course the story is saying something, but mainly when I, uh, get myself attached to a script that I didn't write, that I haven't written. Mm -hmm. I, I Trying I, to honor I, that script first yeah, and foremost. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's yeah. about story. Yeah. yeah. Are there threads through the different stories that you interpret? I mean, I, I bring that up because I want to talk about nonconformity seems to be something you explore. Is that something that's important to you? I wouldn't say that it's uh, conscious. And I, I don't do this of looking back and trying to talk about the ensemble. I can talk one film at a time and mm -hmm. I like to do that. Mm -hmm. But analyzing the work that I've done and finding, trying to find some threads, that's what you said, threads. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and I haven't You're done, not so interested in that. No, I don't want to, uh, no, I don't want to be, I hope, uh, yeah, I don't want to be conscious about it. And I'm sure there are some, and there are some links, there are some things and uh, like you said, the nonconformity, and uh, but the, uh, another thing that I that I know and wasn't conscious, it's the characters, the underdogs. I seem to have a thing for underdogs uh, in every single film, from Crazy to Cafe de Flore with the Down syndrome kids, and and this woman, this mother figure that is uh, a little weird and uh, so loving, but she loves too much. It becomes dangerous and. And then with Dallas Buyers Club, this underdog uh, becoming the spokesperson of a community mm -hmm. that he was bashing for years and years. And, uh, and then while this woman, you know, having sex and cheating on her husband and, and trying to find herself. And now Mitchell, Davis Mitchell. He's an underdog to you. He's an underdog to me, yeah. Because of what we just discussed, you know, he, allowing himself not to react like society, like the others, like they expect us to react. And, and he's a guy, and the, all these underdogs, I think they're trying to find their happiness. Mm. I want to ask you about music in the film. Heart, crazy on you. Yeah. Great song. Why yeah. was it right for this film? It was, see, that's, uh, we got to give credit to uh, Brian. That's Brian's Sipe ID to put, uh, it was in the script. It was the only song written in the script and, uh, and all these lines and, and referred to, you know, to the, to the song. Mm. And uh, he had a thing for this song and, and I wasn't sure at the beginning when I read the script. And I was, oh, don't tell me I'm going to have to work with this song that <laughs> sticks in your head as soon as you... <laughs> hear the title and then you spend that day going let me go crazy on you you know and i and i hate i wasn't a big fan of this song 
But I must say that I always loved the intro, the guitar, mm -hmm. and I used the guitar a lot in the film, and I cut it, you know, very, very violently. You know, and the part you could tolerate, you put that in as much <laughs> yes. as you could. And then, of course, we need a little bit of singing, and mm -hmm. then it's funny. He's in his car. And we were we were just ad libbing these moments when he was driving and putting the music. It wasn't written that hey, you're supposed to sing crazy on you in the car. And then he went wild, you know, and, mm. and it's off. You know, he's singing just before the refrain starts. And and uh, but the music, you know, in this film and most most of the films, you know, when I work with music, the way it's uh, we I try to structure things, I try to find first of all the. Uh, uh, a playlist for each character, then I give them this playlist so they can listen to these tracks and then incorporate these songs into the story, find some moments in the script where they can press play mm. or put a needle on a turntable and the music is coming from the rooms, from a car, and it's not the director and the storyteller that is putting music over that the characters don't hear. Hmm. The characters are hearing the music. It's coming out of the it's story. It's coming out of the story. Therefore, if the scene is over, it cuts. It doesn't go like, oh, the next scene, the music goes over and see, so. That's a great way to put uh, all of the characters in the same emotional space, too. Yeah. They all have the same playlist. Yeah, coming into the film. but but it's different playlist and and it defines them too. Since uh, you know, and this kid in the film, he's the one who's contaminating Davis Mitchell with music and and encouraging him uh, in a way to let's start to listen to some music, man. Maybe you'll feel better about mm. life. About and see when he's seeing this kid playing the drums, starting to be alive, and music makes you. Heels. Feel heels. Yeah. Makes you feel good and mm -hmm. dance. And then he dances in the street. Like, you know, he's starting to feel something and feels good just by watching this rock star kid. You want me to play drums this morning? Is that why it's there? And That's why it's always there for our guests. Go, they man. feel the I'm urge. Go back. <laughs> gonna demolish the... Yeah, well, that's what I wanted to ask you finally. So many things get demolished in this film. Oh, man, I did it. What, you, oh, you, man, I took the sledgehammer. I said, wait, 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 wait. Um, I want to try it first. And, uh, well, I didn't try it first because it, it was a one-take deal. We had one house to demolish, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and that was it. And the crew was hidden, and I was alone with the actors, and they started to demolish everything. And then at one point, I cut, took the sledgehammer, and broke the shit out of a window, man. And it felt so good. I had a big smile on my face. That <laughs> you never have the, the you never the, have the chance. To no. Do that. <laughs> so, <laughs> That's great. I think we'll end on that note, Jean Malcolm. All right. <laughs>